Well, amen. Amen to that song. It's a great song actually to sing towards what we are preaching, or what I'm preaching, I guess, and you're going to be reading uh, in Genesis 19. In Genesis 19. So make your way uh, to that chapter. Um, if you were not here last week, uh, in chapter 18 of Genesis, uh, we see that God desires this friendship with those of Him, or those of you, that would call uh, God your Savior, your Lord, as Abraham did. Uh, and because of, of that, uh, he is a child of God, and God wasn't going to leave Abraham alone. Abraham desired this relationship. In Genesis 18, we see how that friendship with God, that personal relationship with God, manifests in Abraham's life. Not that Abraham was perfect, but that God was working and that he was walking in faith. And that's what we should be doing. As we walk in faith with our friend, God. We see in James chapter 2, just as a reminder for those of you who weren't here, Scripture tells us, in both Isaiah in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament, that Abraham believed God, and because of this, he was called a friend of God. And so we saw in chapter 18 this desire of what this friendship looks like and this personal relationship with God. And so, just to keep us going into chapter 18, I want you to see this friendship but I also want it to be a springboard into chapter 19. So let me just read real quick, uh, toward the end of Genesis 18, this friendship with God. Uh, the pre-incarnate Christ and the two angels, remember, are with Abraham. And in ch starting in verse 16, they start to have a conversation about something that's going to take place. And that's going to lead us into chapter 19. So now, that was my intro, let's get into the Word, okay? It says in Genesis 18, it says this, Then the men set out from there. Those are the two angels. And they looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, the pre-incarnate Christ, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham surely uh, shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him, and keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there, those are the two angels, and the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, stayed with Abraham. And those two angels went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood before the Lord. And so we learn going into chapter 19, that there is a lot of corruption and sin that is going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. It is so bad, and there is no hope for the people in this land. They have turned from God so badly. This city, Sodom and Gomorrah, within this city of Sodom and Gomorrah, there is a believer of God living in this city. His name is Lot. If you remember who Lot is, uh, he is Abraham's nephew. We, we saw him in Genesis uh, 19, and we read from Genesis 19 that Lot was influenced by the world. Though a believer in God, the world had a stranglehold on Abraham's walk. And so we see with Lot the contrast that we see from Abraham. Abraham, a believer, was a friend of God and we see the fellowship that it entails. Now, this morning, we see in Genesis 19 a believer who has become a friend 
of the world. How do I know that Lot is a believer and that he is caught in this world? Well, actually, in the New Testament, 2 Peter tells us about Lot. Peter writes by inspiration of the Holy Spirit this, and if he, meaning God, rescued a righteous Lot. The idea of righteousness in the Old Testament is that they are a believer. It doesn't mean they're perfect. It just means they're a believer. And Lot was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man, again Lot, lived among them day after day, he was tormented or he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. If you remember Lot in Genesis, this worldly push for Lot actually started back in Genesis chapter 13. If you remember, let me remind you. In Genesis 13, remember uh, Abraham's people and Lot's people were arguing. And, and Lot wanted to be a good testimony. And so he said, hey, pick a, pick a piece of land. You go first. And, and, and Lot should have known not to pick a worldly place, but a place that God had promised. But he didn't. He ended up choosing a land because of its worldliness. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the Jordan Valley. That wasn't the place that God had promised. It was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. Remember where Abraham went when he shouldn't have gone? See, Lot already has his eyes on the things of this world and he sees his comfort and his joy coming from the things of the, of the world, not from the one who created the world. This land that he went, it says, is the land that God would destroy called Sodom and Gomorrah. And so now we come to Genesis chapter 19. And from this chapter we read, go to Genesis 19. The start of this chapter, I want you to put your finger here as we walk through this chapter. So again, the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, doesn't go with the angels because he has a, do a job to do. But the angels do come to Sodom in the evening to go after Lot. Because Lot was one of God's children. And Lot was a righteous man, but he was caught up in the world. And Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face on the earth. Now, this is an interesting beginning to chapter 19. And the idea of listening to chapter 19 is that you have read chapter 18. And so what God's Word is doing is giving you a contrast between friendship with God and friendship with the world. Abraham represents friendship with God and Lot represents to the believer what friendship with the world looks like. Lot had gained the world. The idea of sitting in the gate. If you study this out, the actual meaning of that means that Lot gained worldly wealth. The idea is, is that Lot made it in the world. But he forfeited something in return. Lot had gained the world, but he lost his most important walk with God. And as a believer, Lot, as 2 Peter says, he was tormented. But not enough to leave. Because the pull of this world is strong, isn't it? He was a friend of the world, and the world was too strong. Remember Moses by inspiration, is writing these books for Israel, ultimately for us as well as, as believers in Christ. But Moses is writing this in context to Israel and warning them about the worldliness of a follower of God. Every time Sodom is mentioned to Israel, it is always a picture of worldliness. Let me give you an example in Isaiah chapter 3. 
when Isaiah spoke to Israel, he says, for the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. In other words, they brag about it. They know Christ, but they can do what they want. They know God, but they can do what they want. And they don't hide it. Isaiah prophesies, woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Did you know Christ warns us as well? He, wrote, he warns the believer of worldliness. In, I, in James chapter 4, he says this, God's Word says this, James writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, you adulterous people, these are believers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? It's in contrast. It doesn't go together. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of this world makes himself an enemy of God. Paul would address the worldliness of a believer in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let me give you a little insight into this. Paul writes, But I, brothers, couldn't address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. The idea is, is they were living carnally. They were living as worldly people. Amongst, when they were supposed to be separate, they were living like the world. But as people of the flesh, infants of Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you're not ready for it. And even now you're not getting, you're not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? So, so what we have, and I want you to remind yourself as you read God's word, as you pour into God's Word, maybe when you begin in January, when you're reading through the Bible again, and you're starting in Genesis in the whole year, you will come to Genesis 18, and you will come to Genesis 19, and you will remember that God is trying to impress on you the contrast of what it means to be a friend with Him and a friend with the world. That's my desire for you this morning. You need to understand this is important for a believer. Both of these individuals, both Abraham, who was walking in faith, not perfectly, he's still a sinner, and we have Lot, who is absolutely consumed by the world, and God pursues them both. Isn't that a good God? So if you're here this morning and you are caught up in the world, know that your God loves you. He hasn't abandoned you. You aren't so off into the world that God can't rescue you. God wants to meet you. But we have to understand that the world's pull is very hard for a believer. And so this morning, in chapter 19, we are going to see the signs of what it looks like to have friendship with the world. Lot shows us. We put our lives next to Lot and say, is this me? The first thing that we will see is this. If we are a friend to the world, we will have an extremely unbalanced walk of faith. Look at verses 1 through 3 with me. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting at the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down in the face of his ground. Very similar to Abraham's uh, introduction in chapter 18. He says, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet, spend the night, and then go on your way. That's a little different than Abraham. Then you can go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered. We'll spend the night in the square. But he resisted, or he insisted so strongly that he did go with, uh, that they did go with him and entered his house. And look what he did. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without 
yeast. Why did I highlight this? Well, here's the idea. Again, this is meant to be a contrast of Lot and Abraham. One's desire, Abraham's, was sacrifice, adoration. He wanted to spend time with God. And then we have Lot's example. Lot's a believer. He knows the things that are going on in that town aren't right. He knows things aren't good. He knows if the angels stay in this city, they are going to be tortured. They are going to be killed. And it's the city he's living in. So instead of worshiping like Abraham, he just wants them to hurry up and get out of there. He's almost embarrassed. He's embarrassed of where he's at. He's trying to hide who he's become. Look at verse 2 again. It says, then go away in the morning. You can quickly get out of here. Verse 3, he makes bread without yeast. What does this mean? Here's the idea. The idea is unleavened bread is crackers. So instead of the feast that Genesis 18 verses 6 through 8 last week we talked about, Abraham wanted cakes and, and he, he, he got his calf and he wanted a big party for God. Abraham brought out crackers. When you're in the dark, you don't want the spotlight of God on you. And so you hide. You stop fellowshipping. The world starts to get your firsts. And God only gets your seconds. This is what an unbalanced walk with God looks like. A follower of God trying to balance the world that he lives in to a life walking with God. If you're trying to make this balance happen, your life will be out of balance and your joy will be gone. Like Lot's is. He was tormented. He knew it was the wrong place and yet he wouldn't leave. Lot's best. Lot's best for God was crackers. By the way, Israel would be challenged by this as well. Will God get your best? Abraham was willing because he's walking with God. He wants God to get glory out of his life. And yet Lot wants second best. Listen to what Malachi says to Israel. He says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts. O oh, priest who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? He says, by offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have I polluted? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those who are lame and sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept it? And show you favor, says the Lord? And now entreat your favor of God, that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he show favor to any of you? Oh, that there were among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle the fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. I will not accept an offering from your hand. The whole idea here is this. God 
doesn't want your second best. He doesn't want your crackers. And if you live in this world, that's all he's going to get. And we end up losing. A believer in Christ who only gives God his second will be the one who's lost. Like Lot. Jesus would tell the Christ follower this as well. In, in Matthew chapter 6, he says you can't serve two masters. Believer in Christ, you can't serve two masters. For either you will hate the one or you will love the other. Or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Again, the idea here is, is the world. The idea is you can't live and serve the world and serve Christ at the same time. He would say it later in, in chapter 6, verse 33, so seek first the kingdom of God. You see, what, the, what an unbalanced life gives you is what Lot has. What God wants this, you to do is teeter the whole balance towards God's side and you win. You know, it's not like God is withholding something from us. He says, if we give him his best, he gives you his best. Seek first the kingdom of God. So we need to consider this in our own walk. Lot was a believer. But he was torn up by his unbalanced life. What does God need to do to balance our lives out? You know, He would be gracious to do that. Like He is to Lot, He would be gracious to tip the scales towards Him for you, for me. When my life gets out of balance, it is a good thing that He rescues me. Do you see it that way? Does God need to move things out of our unbalanced life? So what else do we see regarding the worldliness of this follower of God? The second thing I want you to see is that he will compromise his morals. You will compromise your morals. Look at verses 4 through 9 with me. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, that tells you how bad it is, usually in, in Old Testament times, the old people were the wise people. They wouldn't do the foolish things like the young people. The idea of Sodom and Gomorrah is both the young and old are completely sick. It's a bad place to be. And they called Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may, that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance and shut the door after him. Keep going. And I said, I beg you, my brothers... Do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do unto them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. One more verse. There you go. And they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn. This is what the people tell Lot. They came to sojourn, and he has become our judge. Now we will deal even worse with them than with him. Uh, than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. So what we see from these verses is Lot offering up his daughters to the crowd. Oh, he's so noble. He was stuck. This worldly follower of God was stuck and he tried to find a worldly way out. Instead of repenting and seeking God, he tries to fix it himself. Look at verse 9 again. Stay right here. Even the unbelievers call him out. You've been living here, Lot. 
and you haven't said anything to us. And now you're going to say something? That's the idea of verse 9. Lot had compromised his morals so much that they were surprised he wouldn't offer them up. You see why the testimony of a follower of Christ is so important? Why our repenting of our sin, humbling ourselves before a holy God is so important to those who don't believe? Lot, Lot offered up his daughters to the mob, but in reality, he had sacrificed them long ago because of his lifestyle. He compromised his morals. Lot had compromised his morals so he could live in the world. So let me ask you, does the world know that you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Will they be surprised by your actions as you walk with Jesus? That's a hard battle, isn't it? I remember very early on in my when Christ saved me. I mean, I used to go to strip joints after work. I used to go to the bars with the guys. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I'd lived my whole life like that. And all of a sudden, I just stopped. And I had two guys come up to me that I used to party with, and they're like, who do you think you are? You think you're better than us? Have you ever gotten that from somebody? And what's your response? Yes, I'm way better than you. No, 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 my response was like yours probably. No, 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 no. God has just changed my life. Do you want to know Him? I don't judge you for what you're doing. You're only doing what's natural. But God has changed my life. And I won't do it anymore. Does the world know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? Or have you compromised your morals? The third one, and I'm going to quicken it up, I promise. The third one, you will begin to make excuses for your sin. What are the signs of worldliness? What are the signs for a believer in God, a believer in Christ, that they are in friends with the world? Not only will your walk be unbalanced, you'll compromise your morals, but you'll start making excuses for sin. We look at verses 15 through 20. As the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up! Take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of this city. But he lingered. I should have highlighted that. So the men seized him. What a gracious God. Seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand and just pulled him. The Lord being merciful to him. And he brought him out and set him out in the city. As they brought them out, he said, escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills lest you be swept away. And Lot said to him, Oh no, my lords. L l listen to this. He just can't let go of the world. Behold, your, if your servant has found favor in your sight and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life, but I can't escape to the hills, meaning I can't get so far away from the world lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, this city, that's Zor, is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. It is not a little, is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. The idea here is that Lot cries out in his worldliness and says, let me just stay in the outer circle of the city. The idea is that Lot still wants the comforts of this world. That he's willing to make excuses. 
What excuses do we make? What excuses do I make for my sin as a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, you know, Jesus will forgive me. He died for my past, present, and future sins. It's even, when I'm not walking with God, it is very easy to make a license to sin rightfully. After reading this verse, I realize how close I get to the world when I make excuses for my sin. Lot had to compromise. Lot had to make excuses. And I'm thankful. I am thankful that Jesus died for my past, my present, and my future sins. But that doesn't give me excuse to live a life apart from God. Why do we make excuses? Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says this, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away, for it's better to you to lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away, for it's better if you lose your whole member than your whole body go to hell. The point is this, we as followers of God need to hate our sin. We just need to hate it. And oftentimes when we are worldly, we don't hate it enough. No more excuses. That's what Lot's trying to teach us. That's what God's Word is trying to teach us. Now go to Genesis chapter 19. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And He overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Why did Lot's, li why did Lot's wife look back? You know, of all the women, think of this, of all the women in all of the Bible, there is only one woman that Jesus tells us we need to remember. Did you know that? There's only one woman in all of the Bible. He says, remember. And you know who it is? It's Lot's wife. Look at Luke chapter 17. He says, likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planning and building. But on the day when the Lot went out of Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all, so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with the goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. The angel said to, said for them to not look back. The idea of us remembering Lot is this. Don't look back in the Hebrew literally means that you have a longing and a desire to go back. The idea of Lot's wife is this. She wanted what she was leaving more than what God was going to give her. And that tells you the difference between Lot and his wife. She was an unbeliever. And she died in her sin. And she is a reminder to anyone here who has not placed their trust in Jesus Christ. You will die in your sins as well. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, He says, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it. So the question you have to answer yourself as you look at Lot is, where is your heart? Have you given your heart to Jesus Christ to give you a new heart in Christ? Follower of Jesus, there should be no excuses. We don't look back because we know what we've been given. 
Last one. And it's a quick one. Here's a sign of worldliness. Your children start following your example of worldliness. Look at verses 30 through 38. Now Lot went up to Zor and lived in the hills and went his two daughters. And he was afraid to live in Zor because it was just outside of Sodom, you'd think. And so he lived in a cave with his two daughters. And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there's not a man on earth to come in and after us, after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve the offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she had arose. Keep going. Then the next day the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I was with my father last night. Let us make him drink again tonight, so we might go in and lie with him and preserve our offspring for our father. So they made their father drink wine and so on and so forth. Verse 37, the firstborn bore a son and they called him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites and the younger Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Amorites. So what's the point? Here's the point. Follower of Christ, if you are worldly, your kids will follow your example. Lot's daughters weren't sorry for the names they named their kids. Do you want to know what Moab means? I mean, just, you need to understand, even in the pagan world, incest was absolutely forbidden, even amongst unbelievers. And so Lot's daughter names the first son Moab, which means the son of my kinsman. It's as if she wanted to be reminded of what she did, and she wanted everyone else to know too. And then Ben-Ami, actually, I'm sorry, Moab means um, from my father. Ben-Ani means son of my kinsman. So both of them just wanted to brag about their sin. Listen, our children mirror us. What we take serious in our walk with Christ, they'll take serious in their walk with Christ. Now, does that mean there aren't exceptions? Bad parents turn out great kids. Absolutely. But those are examples, not descriptions, of what God desires for us as godly parents. We pass on to them what is most important to us. So the question you have to ask yourself is, are you a friend of the world or a friend of God? Like Lot, if you are a believer, you will be tormented. You will be tormented by your sin. You will be tormented by your worldliness. But it, will it be enough for you to change? Because God's desire is to, re re to rescue you. The last thing, and I promise this is it. I want you to see the difference between Lot and Abraham. The main difference is not the actions of Abraham or the actions of Lot. The main difference between Abraham and Lot is Abraham's love for God. And so what God is trying to tell us is your goodness, your good deeds, your doing a bunch of things religiously is not an example of your friendship with God. Your love for God is your example of your relationship with God. It always starts. It always starts. Your walk with God always starts with your love for God. And for those of us who know Jesus, it starts with our love for Jesus and what He did on the cross. And it never stops from there. You want to know the difference between friendship with the world and friendship with, the, with, with God? It'll always come down to your love for Jesus. So which are you? Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be reminded this week, even again,
of how quickly and how, how the world just pulls me as a believer so that both my testimony and my life would be that which is not different than the world that I live in. Lord, I want to be an example. I want to be an example of what people see in You. Your grace and Your mercy. And how much You love us and You desire for us. You show that in Abraham and Lot. God, You are so good and You are worthy to be praised and followed. You are so good and faithful. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, let's stand and sing one final song.